Welcome to another episode in Cappadocia University um, talk series on uh, imagining a, a common horizon for humanity. Uh, I have been uh, moderating this uh, to, for the third time uh, for the first, to, first three talks. Uh, my name is Jamil Aydin. I teach at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, Today, we are very honored to host Professor Joseph Massad uh, in a trilogy almost, but I consider it a trilogy, to think about the crisis of modern international order, modern global political order, uh, persistence of inequality and racial uh, colonialism. Uh, we started with Professor Osama Maktisi and uh, then continued with Professor Adam Getachu. So they are both uh, uploaded on the YouTube channel of Cappadocia University. Uh, today we are hosting uh, Professor Joseph Massad for a talk on independence, the rules of settler colonialism. Uh, let me introduce briefly uh, Professor Massad. Many of you are familiar with his scholarship. Uh, Professor Massad is a leading Palestinian public intellectual and global intellectual. Um, he teaches currently at Columbia University on uh, history and politics. Um, he started uh, uh, his series of publications with a book on uh, colonial effects in Jordan, uh, then wrote uh, Desiring Arabs, a critique um, of Western interest in um, uh, Arab sexuality. Uh, but more importantly, uh, among his many books on uh, Palestine question, he recently uh, completed a very uh, groundbreaking book called Islam and Liberalism, uh, which was published by University of Chicago Press in 2015. And I'm very pleased to note uh, that this wonderful book, which I benefited greatly, uh, talking about the Western liberal obsession with Islam, uh, was recently translated into Turkish, Islamda Liberalism, and also published by Rooney Kitabevi, who published um, Adam Getachev's book on uh, world making after empire and Turkish translation. And you can see the beautiful cover of that book in uh, Turkish translation. I hope you will have a chance to read it. This is one of the best books on the, in the tradition of uh, Edward Say's Orientalism. Uh, but all going beyond that, in terms of thinking about um, racialization of Islam and Muslims. And for Ottomanist, uh, the book has one of the best uh, discussion of the Eastern question, which Professor Joseph Massad calls it as Western question. But we are looking forward to uh, this talk, which will be part of Professor Joseph Massad's new book, that's forthcoming book. So we are privileged to have an insight of a chapter of the book or the general argument of the book uh, called Independence, the Rules of Settler Colonialism. Um, so Professor Massad will actually read the talk uh, and, and then we will have a discussion. You, uh, the audience, currently can uh, send the questions and comments through um, uh, the phone number that will be provided to you under uh, the screen. And I will read them on their behalf. I will also have my set of questions. But Professor Massad, uh, we, will, um, we are listening to you now. The floor is yours. Professor Aydin for this uh, generous introduction. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you uh, may be in the different time zones of the globe. Uh, indeed, uh, the lecture uh, uh, that I'm uh, going to be giving this afternoon is based on a new book that has the working title of um, The Age of Independence, a Global History of Settler Colonialism. One of the most remarkable aspects of the independence of states that remains ignored, elided, downplayed, and evaded in scholarly research is the white supremacist settler colonial origins of the very notion of a state's independence. It was the establishment of the first white supremacist European colonial state in 1776 by white colonists in what became the United States that inaugurated the age of independence, a trajectory that ends with the Unilateral Declaration of Independence, or UDI, by the European colonial settlers of Rhodesia on 11 November 1965. Indeed, the last white supremacist declaration of independence of Rhodesia's colonial settlers pays homage to the first in borrowing their North American counterparts' exact words to declare their own independence from ver the very same mother country. The connection between the two independent white supremacist colonial settler states uh, was, not, um, hold on, yes, um, was not lost on the British, 
1963, the government of the British Minister Harold, or Prime Minister Harold Macmillan's Conservative Party prepared contingency plans for intervening in Rhodesia to prevent a potential unilateral independence. The secret file containing the relevant British documents was titled Boston Tea Party. The, the secession and subsequent independence of Europe's white colonists in the settler colonies of the Americas, Asia, Africa, and Oceania takes place during the almost two centuries that separate the independence of the first and last white supremacist colonial settler states. During this period and after, independence would become the political and economic goal of the natives of Europe's colonies and settler colonies, both within Europe in Ireland and Poland, and across the globe. But if the 19th century ushered in the independence of the North, of the North, Central, and South American and Caribbean settler colonies, and some of the Oceanian and African settler colonies, and the Christian European provinces of the European, in, in, in quotation marks, of course, the Christian European provinces of the Ottoman state, the momentum of independence advanced more rapidly in the wake of World War I, both for the white colonial settlers of North America, Africa, and Oceania, as much as for the natives of Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Americas. The pace became unstoppable after World War II. Aside from the independence of the European settler colonies of Israel in 1948, South Africa, which stopped being a dominion in 1961, and Rhodesia in 1965, Scores of Europe's colonies, protectorates, and mandated territories obtained independence, ushering in the world of independent states across the globe. Since independence as a concept and political practice seems to equate the now independent countries, whether controlled by natives or colonial settlers, it simultaneously ends the era of formal colonialism and perpetuates and legitimates not only economic imperialism, but also formal settler colonialism, recognizing both as in possession of sovereignty ratified by the latest global forum designed to grant such legitimacy, namely the United Nations. Yet, independence as both a political idea and practice of sovereignty continues to be marketed by all these countries as a political and economic good that ended the unjust rule of colonial powers in the case of the colonies or that of the mother countries in the case of settler colonies, even and especially if in the case of the latter, it meant the continued subjugation of the indigenous peoples from the First Nations of Canada and the Native Americans of the US and the indigenous populations across Central and South America to the Aborigines of Australia, the Palestinians, the Maoris, the Kanaka Maoli uh, of Hawaii, and not least Black South Africans and Zimbabweans. Whence arose this concept of independence? What was its historical and geographic trajectory? How did this white European settler colonial principle become also the goal of the colonized natives and indigenous peoples of the world. That the formal independence of white Protestant British colonial settlers resulted in outcomes far different from the formal independence of the natives of Europe's colonies, or even that of the Spanish and Portuguese colonial settlers and their mixed race descendants seemed to signal to many European and white American commentators less that the principle of independence was invented to benefit mainly Europe's English-speaking Protestant colonial settlers from its inception, but rather that the colonially predicted failure of natives and non-English settlers to manage their own affairs. In my lecture today, I will trace some of the juridical, philosophical, and political histories of the concept and practice of independence, in order to understand its global effects as the primary principle for the existence of the state system since the late 18th century, and how the concept of self-determination would join it during and after World War I as a corollary to institute white European colonial and settler colonial privileges over the indigenous peoples of the colonies. Most accounts of independence depicted as an outcome of the European Enlightenment and revolutionary thought, 
which is committed to, we are told, universal human equality and freedom. In fact, the genealogy of the concept of independence is entirely inseparable from the 18th century new ideology of white supremacy and settler colonialism, and that this deep co-foundationalism is what liberal Euro-American historians and theorists and their disciples need to forget, to repress, and deny. Before the term independence came into existence and acquired political significance and legal status, other concepts were used to separate from or leave the control of a sovereign. The, the Dutch Act of Abjuration of 1581 is often referred to anachronistically to mean a declaration of independence, especially as it is alleged that American colonial settlers would later cite it as an inspirational precedent to their own desire to declare independence, even though the Dutch Plakat van Verlantieve was in fact a renunciation, the Dutch word means abandonment, so it was a renunciation of the sovereignty of King Philip II of Spain, in effect a secession. Secession itself, of course, is a 16th century English term. Uh, but the, the, the Plakat did not posit notions of dependence or independence as operative. The Dutch abjuration was a religious one of Protestants resisting the religious persecution of King Philip, but also a territorial and economic one, wherein sections of the Dutch nobility and bourgeoisie felt insecure about being part of a much larger empire and wanted to secure their interests from outside control. Still, the coupling of the whiteness and Protestantism of the English-speaking settlers would set them apart from all others in the course of the centuries to come, as they would be the only colonists to achieve both political and economic independence. The other two exceptions would be the British-sponsored settler colonies of South Africa and its Dutch and English white Protestant colonists, and the European Jewish settler colony of Israel, whose colonial project was designed by British Protestant evangelicals. It is in the middle of the 18th century, in the latest literature on the law of nations, however, where the term independence is inaugurated and would soon acquire a juridical and technical sense, referring to the status of a state and what becomes the society of nations. The ancient Roman notion of jus gentium, which was private law that dealt with relations among individuals within the Roman Imperium, and not with foreign relations, was adopted in the first half of the 17th century to different ends and endowed with different meanings by the Dutch jurist Hugo Grotius, inaugurating a new doctrine in juridical and political parlance, governing also relations between states. Jus gentium was translated but misapprehended in the 18th century as the law of nations and later as international law, and, this new, and the new significations were often anachronistically applied to this ancient and medieval Roman notion, though Jeremy Bentham's later coinage of the term international, rather than Immanuel Kant's, Kant's interstatal, uh, remained operative. Yet the basis of what becomes modern international law was in fact created by the colonial encounter in the, in the Americas in the 16th century, through the major figure of Francisco de Vitoria, a precursor to Grotius, and were in the questions of civilized and barbarian nations of defensive and aggressive wars, later just and unjust wars, were concretized and continue to inform the discipline through the present. However, the independence of states too cool did not become part of this legal lexicon for another century or so. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the word independent is a 17th century English term that begins to be used in a political sense in mid-century. Thomas Hobbes uses it in 1651 in the Leviathan to refer to the different branches of a mixed monarchy, as he called it, which led to civil war in England. Hobbes offered a contrary view to Grotius's and others' understanding of jus gentium, insisting on it being exclusively an affair between states and not individuals. It took another century before the term independence in French or independency 
and later independence in English to begin to acquire a political meaning akin to what it would refer, uh, refer by the last quarter of the 18th century. The term remained in flux in the 1740s and beyond, especially so as Montesquieu himself did not use it in his 1748 Spirit of the Laws in this technical sense. In contrast to its later political signification, Montesquieu used the term in reference to an unconstrained individual, not governed by laws, or one who lived in a state of nature. He seemed to equate independence with unlimited freedom, which he insisted was not the same as liberty. This aside, Montesquieu does not apply the term independence to states, nor to individuals who live within them. He elaborates on this when he explains that, quote, we must continually have present to our minds the difference between independence and liberty. Liberty is a right of doing whatever the laws permit, and if a citizen could do what they forbid, he would be no longer possessed of liberty, because all his fellow citizens would have the same power. In line with the reigning climatology of the times, Montesquieu worried that in warmer climates, bodies are more susceptible to vice, including love and passion, than they are in colder ones where people, and I quote him, have few vices, so much so that in southern countries, a machine of a delicate frame but strong sensibility resigns itself either to a love which rises and is incessantly laid in a seraglio, or to a passion which leaves women in greater independence and is consequently exposed to a thousand inquietudes. For Montesquieu, not only are Muslim societies endowed with such climatological inclinations towards vice, but so are Catholic ones. It is in this context that he understands liberty as the sole endowment of Northern European Protestants. When the Christian religion, he tells us, two centuries ago, became unhappily divided into Catholic and Protestant, the people of the North embraced the Protestant and those of the South adhered still to the Catholic. The reason is plain. The people of the North, he tells us, have and will forever have a spirit of liberty and independence, which the people of the South have not. And therefore, a religion which has no visible head is more agreeable to the independence of the climate than that which has one. It is in the German, uh, it is in the German Christian uh, or, or Christian von Wolf uh, in his book, The Law of Nations, published in 1749, a year after Montesquieu's book, that we find the early transformation of the term independent, the adjective, into its later technical signification in a few scattered references. Whereas there is no reference in the book to the independence of states, the adjective independent is used in relation to nations and peoples. I quote him, by nature, nations are free and therefore the civil power, consequently the mode of exercising it or the form of the state is quite independent of other nations. A decade later, it was the Swiss Emmer de Vatel, a student of Wolf, who would use the term in such a manner that instituted it as the new technical term that came to be known as the independence of a state. In his 1758 Le Droit de Jean, Vatel mentions a state's independence of other states when he speaks of the ability of a state to, quote, discharge the duties she owes to herself and to her citizens, unquote. In his enumeration of the laws of nations, Vatel lists, and I quote, the liberty and independence of nations as his second general law, explaining that nations being free and independent of each other in the same manner as men are naturally free and independent, unquote. He adds later that, quote, after, after having established the position that foreign nations have no right to interfere in the government of an independent state, it is not difficult to prove that the latter has a right to oppose such interference. To govern herself according to her own pleasure is a necessary part of her independence." Unquote. The question of settler colonialism is paramount in the mind and thought of Vatel, 
which may explain his later popularity among the white Protestant English-speaking colonists and their descendants in the 13 British colonies of North America. In the tradition of John Locke and other liberal political theorists, Vattel was intent on justifying white European colonization of the lands of non-Europeans and registered his support specifically for English-speaking settler colonists as he was more discriminatory than others in refusing to grant legitimacy to all settler colonization. Let me quote him for you. Those who still pursue this idle mode of life usurp more extensive territories than with a reasonable share of labor they would have occasion for and have therefore no reason to complain if other nations more industrious and too closely confined come to take possession of a part of those lands. Thus, though the conquest of the civilized empires of Peru and Mexico was a notorious usurpation, the establishment of many colonies on the continent of North America might, on their confining themselves within just bounds, be extremely lawful. The people of those extensive tracts rather ranged through than inhabited them." Unquote. His notion of independence indeed focuses on settler colonialism as its principal example. He tells us that, quote, an independent individual, whether he has been driven from his country or has legally quitted it of his own accord, may settle in a country which he finds without an owner and there possess an independent domain. Whosoever would afterwards make himself master of the entire country could not do it with justice without respecting the rights and independence of this person. But if he himself finds a sufficient number of men who are willing to live under his laws, he may form a new state within the country he has discovered and possess there both the domain and the empire. Patel's outright justification of the colonization of North America is relentless, even as he also justifies the colonization of the land of pastoral Arabs or nomadic Bedouins. He tells us, the savages of North America had no right to appropriate all that vast continent to themselves. And since they were unable to inhabit the whole of those regions, other nations might without injustice settle in some parts of them provided they left the natives a sufficiency of land. If the pastoral Arabs would carefully cultivate the soil, a less space might be sufficient for them. Nevertheless, no other nation has a right to narrow their boundaries unless she be under an absolute want of land. For in short, they possess their country. They make use of it after their manner. They reap from it an advantage suitable to their manner of life respecting which they have no laws to receive from anyone. In a case of pressing necessity, I think people might without injustice settle in a part of that country. On teaching the Arabs the means of rendering it by the cultivation of the earth sufficient for their own wants and those of the new inhabitants." Unquote. Vattel's influence on North American figures who led the 13 colonies to independence was most pronounced. While the first translation of his book into English appeared in 1760, Benjamin Franklin informed the Swiss publisher in December 1775 that the book, and I quote, has been continuously in the hands of our Congress now sitting, unquote. Vattel's book became a staple textbook at American colleges, and after the establishment of the Republic, the favorite authority in American theory of international law. White settler colonists' disenchantment with the British crown was on account of increasing concentration of wealth in the hands of English capitalists at home who were competing with settler merchants after the major improvement in economic conditions which prevailed after 1720, but especially after 1745. This was followed by a series of taxes imposed on the settlers, especially the Sugar Act and the Currency Act of 1764 and the Stamp Act of 1765, which reduced their profits further in favor of the crown. Profits made possible by continued colonization of the land of Native Americans and slave labor. This was all the more poignant as it came on the heel of the 1763 Royal Proclamation prohibiting the white colonists from colonizing lands west of Appalachia in the Ohio Valley which were reserved for Native Americans and forcing those colonists who had done so to evacuate the colonized lands and move east. 
This infuriated the white colonists and created a major schism with the British crown. It also led a majority of Native Americans to fight alongside the British against the white colonists during the Revolutionary War due to their sober assessment that a victory for the white colonists meant more devastation for them. In Prelude to Independence, American historian Arthur Schlesinger describes the pre-revolutionary meanings of key words, including independence. He tells us, the stigmatizing of British policy as tyranny or oppression or slavery had little or no objective reality, at least prior to the British imposed intolerable acts of 1774. But ceaseless repetition of the charge kept emotions at fever pitch. On the other hand, soul-stirring words like liberty, freedom, and independence, though at first they connoted nothing more than, that, than the status the colonies had enjoyed before 1763, meaning before the Sugar Act, the Currency Act, and the Stamp Act, came in time to pack a revolutionary meaning. Correspondingly, the magic term American, implying a nationality, an allegiance apart from the mother country, gradually replaced the oldest separatist denigrations of New Yorker, Virginian, and so on. The emergence of the term American that came to be increasingly used in the 1760s by the white settler colonists, also replacing the earlier terms of colonists and settlers, is most important in this regard, as it signals a major transformation in the term and its generative power for indigenizing the colonists and the invention of a national identity. It is in this context that Benedict Anderson noted in Imagined Communities that colonial settlers were the progenitors of the concept of national identity and nationalism that would later have worldwide resonance. Most important to stress, however, is that notions of freedom, liberty, and independence for the white Protestant male colonists, slave owning or not, essentially meant little more than safeguarding their property, including their slaves, and their businesses from the encroachment of Britain and its taxation, which to them seemed like a form of slavery. Independence for the white Protestant settler colonists, therefore, had centrally an economic sense, with the corresponding, politic with the corresponding political sense ensuring the economic one. This would change considerably when less than two decades later, independence reached the revolutionary and newly uh, created state of Haiti, who black and colored peoples overthrew colonial slavery, but were subjected to an economic siege by the US and Europe and forced to pay indemnities to France. When independence reached Spanish America four decades later, the new state's indebtedness to Britain would saddle their independence since its inception. In line with this application of independence to non-English speaking colonists, let alone the, block, the, the black and colored former slaves of Saint-Domingue, later Haiti, after World War I, and especially after World War II, the national independence of non-white peoples would become operatively political and anything but economic. It would be left to the English-born white colonial settler, Thomas Paine, who arrived in the British American colonies in 1774 to elaborate on what he called the doctrine of independence in his mass circulated pamphlet, Common Sense, which he addressed, quote, to the inhabitants of America and published on the 14th of February, 1776. In Common Sense, Spain defines the term independency as follows. Is the power who is jealous of our prosperity a proper power to govern us? Whoever says no to this question is an independent, for independency means no more than whether we shall make our own laws or whether the king, the greatest enemy this continent hath or can have, shall tell us there shall be no laws but such as I like. Cain identifies the enemies of the idea of independence as enemies of settler colonialism. He tells us, and I quote again, Ye that oppose independence now, ye know not what ye do. Ye are opening a door to eternal tyranny, by keeping vacant the seat of government. There are thousands and tens of thousands who would think it glorious to expel from the continent that barbarous and hellish power which hath stirred up the Indians and Negroes to destroy us. The cruelty hath a double guilt. It is dealing brutally by us and treacherously by them. 
Despite his opposition to slavery and recognition of the theft of Native American lands and livelihoods, Payne's understanding of independence was exclusive to the white colonial settlers within the rubric of English-speaking Protestant white supremacy. During the so-called Revolutionary War, both the Northern colonists and the British Crown promised black slaves freedom if they joined their respective armies, but tens of thousands of slaves preferred to support the British, and, thous and thousands fought for them. In the case of the rebel southern colonies, in contrast with the North, Virginia, Georgia, and the Carolinas, uh, where Professor Ideen teaches, promised land and a slave to go with it to white men who would volunteer to fight in the struggle against the British. This legacy of independence would not only be espoused by white French slave-owning San Domingans or the white Creoles of Spanish America, but also the Dutch settlers of South Africa, black American colonists of West Africa, mainly Liberia, but also Sierra Leone, and by the end of the 19th century, the English and French colonists of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, um, the mixed race uh, Indo-European colonists of Batavia and Indonesia, not to mention the Anglo-Indians, the Rehoboth Bastards of Namibia, the French colon of Algeria, the Zionist Jewish colonists of Palestine, and the British colonists of Rhodesia. They will be joined at the turn of the 20th century by the colonized peoples of the world, those living in colonies and settler colonies, who would use a more recent concept to achieve independence that came to be known as self-determination. It is often claimed that anti-colonial nationalism and self-determination have a coeval history. Indeed, that self-determination is the principle through which anti-colonialists would achieve their declared goal of independence from colonialism. The story goes that not only have anti-colonialism and self-determination emerged around the same historical juncture, but that they are also imbricated in one another. Indeed, that the colonial recognition of one automatically leads to the col colonial recognition of the other. Yet on closer inspection, this seems to be a misleading narrative. Not only does the dominant form of self-determination seem to be a principle designed to limit the claims of anti-colonial nationalism and to enhance the claims of colonialism, especially the settler colonial variety and its right of conquest, but even more importantly, colonial and settler colonial resistance and reticence to recognizing the colonized as nations that deserve independence would only be mitigated once self-determination became the operative criterion by which substantive political, let alone economic independence, can be negated. In the case of settler colonialism, the settler colonists would only accede to a recognition that the indigenous peoples whose land they usurped are nations is the moment self-determination is introduced as a principle or a right that not only would not lead to the declared goal of independence from settler colonialism, but rather one that would effectively obstruct it. This can be observed in settler colonies around the globe, from the Americas to Australia, from Palestine to Algeria, to Rhodesia and South Africa, the colonial settlers fought and mostly preserved their right of conquest as a right to self-determination. European colonial nationalism was predicated on the understanding that colonizing countries like Britain and France formed nations which were judged as a civilized form of community and even as a political achievement that many among the colonized did not constitute, let alone were able to achieve. It was in this context that the British denied that the Egyptians or the Indians constituted nations rather than a motley of different communities, tribes, clans, castes, sects, etc. The French, too, denied that the Algerians were a nation. Egypt's English ruler, Lord Cromer, identified Egyptians as, and I quote him, the dwellers in Egypt, insisting that there were no such things as true Egyptians, rather a bunch of Fallahin, Bedouin, Copts, Turks, Syrians, Jews, Azhar Sheikhs, Circassians, Levantine nondescripts whose ethnological status defies diagnosis, Greeks, Armenians, Tunisians, Algerians, Sudanese, Maltese, and, quote, half-breeds of every, of every description. 
unlike, and he, he continues, unlike the Englishmen, the Frenchmen, or the Germans, whom one could tell by looking at their faces, the dwellers in Egypt were no nation politically or physiognomically, let alone a single race. The French racial colonial policy in Algeria before 1954 aimed specifically to diminish the commonalities among Algerians and to stress instead their differences. For French colonialism, the Algerians consisted of Grand Kabylie, Petit Kabylie, Ore, who were like the mixed Berbers and Arabs, Arabs and Blacks. In the case of India, it was Winston Churchill who declared, and I quote, India is an abstraction. India is a geographical term. It is no more a united nation than the equator, unquote. Golda Meir, the leader of the European Jewish colonists of Palestine, declared as late as 1969, and in the tradition of other Zionist claims, that, quote, it was not as though there was a Palestinian people in Palestine considering itself as a Palestinian people, and we came and threw them out and took their country away from them. They did not exist, unquote. The denial of the national identity of those colonized by European colonists should be contrasted with the support European powers gave in the 19th century to nationalisms within the Ottoman, uh, within the Ottoman state for the purpose of breaking it up. Here, European support for Christian, Greek, and Bulgarian nationalisms are prime examples. We can talk more about Greece and Greek independence. I have a big section on Greece uh, in the book, uh, precisely because it is not a, a, a settler colony um, as the rest of the examples are. But uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very interesting case uh, to look at. Uh, perhaps we can discuss that uh, in the Q&A. It was in the context of the scramble for Africa and the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885 that discussions supported indigenous Africans' right to dispose of their own lands to European colonists. Indeed, the scramble had been increasingly put into effect through negotiating treaties with native sovereigns. One of the American delegates to the Berlin Conference a fellow by the name of John Casson insisted that modern international law excuse me, was leading to the recognition of the right of native tribes to dispose freely of themselves and of their hereditary territory, and that this right was to be extended to require the voluntary consent of the natives whose country is taken possession of in all cases where they had not provoked the aggression. Is this right of the colonized to dispose of themselves, argues Siva Grovogi, that was construed in the 20th century as self-determination. The rise of anti-colonial nationalisms in, uh, in the World War I period forced a major concession on colonizing powers, one that could threaten colonial rule altogether. Coeval with this development, European colonial settlers in Africa and Asia were also looking for an arrangement that would limit the authority of the colonial mother country, while at the same time preserve and expand European colonial settler privileges. In the case of the European colonists of Southern Africa, this began since the middle of the 19th century with some success, but was defeated by the British in the Boer Wars. In the case of the European Jewish colonists of Palestine, it awaited the end of World War I. The French colonists in Algeria already sought independence in the late 19th century, but could not achieve it. They would stage a coup in 1961 against the French government when they realized it was about to concede independence to the Algerian National Liberation Front. A new colonial formula was needed to appease anti-colonial nationalist demands for independence while prolonging colonial and settler colonial rule indefinitely. But as self-determination had emerged in the late 1890s as a socialist principle espoused by Karl Kautsky, but more importantly by Vladimir Ilyich Lenin as an anti-colonial right par excellence, colonizing countries and settler colonists became concerned with its increasing popularity. It was in this context of the Russian Revolution which quickly moved to apply self-determination to the non-Russian subjects of the former Russian Empire especially in uh, the, set, the Russian settler colonies in Asia, um, uh, which uh, the Russian Revolution immediately uh, reversed by uh, giving the indigenous population equal rights and stopping all settler colonization. In that context, it was, that Woodrow, it was in that context that Woodrow Wilson hijacked the socialist concept 
and deplored it at the Paris Peace Conference as a right to be granted only to the colonies of the defeated empires of World War I, but certainly not to those colonized by the victorious empires. Lenin agreed with Rosa Luxemburg that nationalism could never bring economic independence, nor grant economic agency to the national working class. But unlike Luxembourg, he insisted on the importance of political self-determination against the chauvinism of colonizing peoples like the great Russians and distinguished between the nationalism of oppressor and oppressed nations supporting the latter. Wilson's concept of self-determination, unlike Lenin's, was one that granted political agency not only to the colonized in the defeated empires, but also to the colonizers and sought to balance the two equally as he put it, the interests of the population's concern must have equal weight with the equitable government whose title is to be determined. Here, Wilson's explicit aim was to equate the powerful and the powerless, or as Lenin would have it, to equate the oppressor nations with the oppressed nations. And Wilson seemed to posit self-determination here as a mask for the right of conquest, rather as its undoing. Wilson's support for the mandate system that was answerable to the new League of Nations was essentially support for a new institutional cover for imperial conquests. Of course, uh, uh, the Russian revolutionaries referred to the mandate system as the new imperialism um, uh, in this context. This assessment was shared across Europe by the victors. Post-World War I territorial rearrangements by the victors relied on the right of conquest and not on the right of self-determination primarily in order to prevent the emergence of a German superstate encompassing all the German-speaking populations of Europe. That's while the socialist and Leninist pedigree of self-determination was now being co-opted for the purpose of an American and European imperial propaganda war, in reality what triumphed after World War I, especially through the League of Nations, was a right of conquest through which the territorial spoils of the war would be redistributed. Like independence, self-determination in the colonial world was also first demanded by white colonial settlers in South Africa following the Boer War. Here we need to pay special attention to settler colonies as a model that was also extended to non-settler colonies. It was the South African Afrikaner leader, Jan Smuts, who articulated the colonial principle of self-rule and who guided the formulation of the ideal of self-determination later attributed to Woodrow Wilson. The earlier principle of self-rule had been in use by European settler colonists, particularly across the British Empire, but as it did not include the indigenous populations in its purview, it did not acquire the universal appeal that the Wilsonian definition of self-determination would after World War I, primarily due to the latter's application to colonists and natives alike, and equalizing non-equals in a move to undermine Lenin's definition. The British Lord Curzon was explicit at a cabinet meeting when he declared in December 1918 that Britain, and I quote, will play self-determination for whatever it's worth to maintain colonial gains. Or more precisely, uh, to use self-determination as a cover for the right of conquest. Former British governor of Nigeria and British representatives, representative to the Permanent Mandates Commission of the League of Nations, Lord Frederick Lugard, adopted the strategy and ran with it. He articulated it in his classic guide to British colonial officials. I quote him, the tropics are the heritage of mankind and neither on the one hand has the suzerain power, a right to their exclusive exploitation, nor, on the other hand, have the races that inhabit them a right to deny their bounties to those who need them. His method, reminiscent of de Vattel's justifications of colonial conquests, worked well for the non-settler colonies, where Lugard supported, quote, native rulers and their councils, but not representative government. In the settler colonies, however, as in Kenya and Rhodesia, let alone in South Africa and Palestine, the European settlers had a different set of local priorities, not directly attached to the mother country. Rhodesia is most similar to Palestine in that its colonization by white colonial settlers begins in the 1890s rather than earlier, as is the case with South Africa and Algeria or the Americas and Australia. 
And indeed, the colonists acquire a great deal of power in Rhodesia in the early 1920s, just like the Zionists did, though Rhodesia's colonists were the first to become a self-governing colony with their own parliament, army, and police, exercising a Wilsonian, if you will, self-determination as early as 1923 through what was called responsible government. All in all, Lugard's influence, as Susan Peterson states, and I quote, consolidated and legitimated a reaction against self-determination. This is true, however, or this is true only if self-determination is understood in its Leninist rather than its reformulated Wilsonian version. If the latter, then Lugard's influence in fact consolidated the imperial definition of what self-determination meant. Thus, self-determination for Europe and the US moved from support for white colonial settlers in the American, African, Asian, and Oceanian colonial settlements to accommodate collaborating colonized nationalist elites, something that would be, would be put to practice across the globe following World War II, and which became the basis for the Fanonian critique of anti-colonial nationalism. The hegemonic idea that self-determination is some progressive principle that has always had a socialist and or anti-colonial history which grants the colonized political agency is consequently erroneous as it ignores how self-determination was imperially co-opted and transformed from its socialist context early on and continued to be adopted by imperial and colonial settler powers for the express purpose of maintaining colonial gains especially in the case of settler colonies where agency is granted differentially to the colonists at the expense of the colonized. It should be remembered that even Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, just like Wilson and Lord George before them, found the concept of self-determination an excellent mask for the right of conquest, which they used to annex territories with German speakers to the Third Reich, most famously, of course, Austria and the Sudetenland. While varieties of nationalism as ideology identified language, religion, economy, territory, ethnicity, race, and blood as bases for common identity and difference, the national and the foreigner were defined juridically across colonial nation states since the inception of laws of nationality in the last quarter of the 19th century in relation to two exclusive bonds, namely blood and soil. The Germans, had been the forerunners of Jus Sanguinis, often seen as an essentialist concept, while the French historically opted for Jus Soli, seen as anti-essentialist. Post-colonial states followed suit with laws replicating verbatim those of their colonial masters, often with a combination of Jus Soli and Jus Sanguinis. What colonial settlers were able to achieve is the conjuring up of this connection for themselves and its severance for the indigenous and colonized under the capacious umbrella of self-determination. This is as true for Canada's First Nations as it is for Australian Aborigines, South African and Zimbabwean Blacks, United States Native Americans, and the Palestinians inter alia. Excuse me. After World War II, European colonizers and colonists slowly accepted that there was no escape from recognizing that the colonized two were nations and were entitled to self-determination. Such recognition became the colonial mechanism that navigated which blood and soil schematization is prior prioritized over others. The strategy followed across settler colonies was as follows. Recognize you solely and you sanguinis for all the colonial settlers to ensure their control of all the land they stole and steal, but concede that the, that the indigenous are nations in the, in the sense of use sanguinis, which the colonizers and colonists had previously denied. This would grant the indigenous no more than national, cultural, and identity rights. So, for example, the Israelis would say, yes, you know, the Pal now we recognize that the Palestinians of the 1948 territories are connected in terms of identity and nationhood with those of the 1967 territories or of those in the diaspora. So, you know, they can have their cultural programs, even their, you know, their flag if they want. 
But however, we don't recognize the right to the land. So their blood rights, their connection, use sanguinis, would be recognized, but not uh, uh, their use solely. This would be, uh, the Palestinians are no exception. This would be applied universally, as I will show you. Simultaneously, the colonizers and the colonists, in keeping with John Locke, de Vattel, Wilson, Lord George, and Lugard, would insist on denying the indigenous peoples, as I just said, use solely to keep their, to keep their lands in the hand of colonial settlers. This became the operative criterion since the 1960s, both in specific cases, um, or in the specific cases of the settler colonies of Algeria, Kenya, and Zimbabwe, as well as in South Africa and Palestine. But more importantly, it was generalized through the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, issued in 2007. It is known as UNDRIP, which cemented this understanding. The preamble to UNDRIP states explicitly, and I quote, that nothing in this declaration may be used to deny any peoples their right to self-determination exercised in conformity with international law, which could easily, however, uh, end of quote, which could easily apply to colonial settlers as it often has. Indeed, the Barack Obama administration who voted against UNDRIP in 2007 decided to accept it in 2010 through affirming Article 6 of the declaration, which ensures that UNDRIP does not threaten the territories colonized by European colonial settlers. The article stipulates that, quote, nothing in this declaration may be interpreted as implying for any state, people, group, or person any right to engage in any activity or to perform any act contrary to the Charter of the United Nations or construed as authorizing or encouraging any action which would dismember or impair totally or in part the territorial integrity or political unity of sovereign and independent states." Unquote. As such, the Declaration has limited the general understanding of self-determination in international law further as one that used to grant the right to independence by transforming this right when, um, when applied to indigenous populations as one that grants them only the right to self-government and political participation within existing states and not outside their sovereignty. Therein lies the historical and contemporary form of the problem of self-determination and its legal and rhetorical links to anti-colonial nationalism and the quest for independence, but most especially to the, to the European settler colonies. The situation of the Palestinians, where the European Jewish colonial settlers continue to rule, seems to instantiate one form or perhaps functions as one of its many, many iterations. Think of the Maoris, the Aborigines of Australia, the First Nations of Canada, Native Americans in the US, and Native peoples across Latin America. Yet another form of the problem would be that of Rhodesia and South Africa. In the case of Rhodesia, upon the imminent defeat of the white colonists through the Lancaster House Agreement of 1979, which facilitated the independence of Zimbabwe, the British government undertook to safeguard all the settlers' colonially acquired land. The agreement tied the hands of the post-independence government of Zimbabwe from initiating land reform in the country for 10 years initially, while the British government, as well as the US government under Jimmy Carter, provided funds to compensate white colonists on a willing seller, willing buyer basis, ensuring that use solely would be preserved for the white colonists and would continue to be denied to Zimbabwe's native black population. The situation would end up holding for two decades until the year 2000, when the government initiated a forced takeover of white owned farms without compensation. The Western response to this violation of the right of conquest of white settlers was swift. Sanctions were immediately imposed on Zimbabwe by the United States, the United Kingdom, and the European Union. In the case of South Africa, the moment political self-determination was granted to the majority non-white population in 1994, international economic bodies and instruments took away economic self-determination and limited the new state's sovereign ability to exercise it by insisting that economic decisions related to property remain in the hands of the white colonial settler population who owns it, the IMF, and the World Bank. Here, Lenin's understanding of self-determination as political in nature 
and Luxembourg's understanding that it could never be economic come into play, but in a more insidious form, wherein whatever erstwhile pretensions about political and economic sovereignty existed before have now been done away with. In this case, the interplay between jus soli and jus sanguinis to undo the right to self-determination is camouflaged as an exchange of political rights, which every South African, regardless of race, now has, for economic ones, wherein white South Africans, in alliance with white international capital, possess almost exclusively. And this is not unlike what the Evian Accords achieved in Algeria uh, back in the early 60s, and the Lancaster House conferences achieved in Kenya in the same period. Uh, the Lancaster House ach Agreement achieved in Zimbabwe in the late 70s, or even what UNDRIP insists on now in the Americas, in the Americas and in Oceania. Here, self-determination guarantees white colonial settlers' right of conquest of the land and its wealth based on a white supremacist use sanguinis at the moment that it equalizes the settlers politically with the non-white natives regarding use solely, while prohibiting the newly equalized blacks, Indians, and coloreds from using self-determination as an antidote to the landed and other wealth acquired through the right of conquest. But the story of the Palestinians, black South Africans, and Zimbabweans, and indigenous peoples in the Americas and Oceania clarifies is that self-determination is not only, not the only route to political and economic independence, but that it is also the legal and rhetorical strategy and the principle that has blocked it from ever being realized. In short, whereas self-determination led to political independence of some European states after World War I and of the European colonies in Asia and Africa after World War II, in the settler colonies, and in line with the ideas circulating at the Berlin Conference more than 130 years ago, self-determination has mostly been and continues to be the enemy of the political and economic goals of independence from settler colonial rule. As ruses of settler colonialism, the principles of independence and self-determination have exclusively served white colonial settlers who deployed them against the non-white colonized and indigenous peoples of the world, and they continue to do so with impunity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Massad. This is exactly what uh, I think Cappadocia University um, uh, President uh, Professor Hassan Adi Karasar was uh, thinking when he initiated this project of uh, reimagining common humanity. Um, this is a perfect lecture to end this uh, first three uh, conversations on the crisis, intellectual and political crisis we face today. Um, and your lecture really uh, tells us that um, there is some sort of moral pollution, epistemic crisis too, that um, what we see as, as a crisis of the nation state uh, is not uh, due to the misapplications of a good principle. The principles are themselves are actually implicated, uh, are the problems themselves. And then your examples are, are really insightful. I mean, that Jan Smuts, the, uh, Saad, uh, the architect of South Africa's um, apartheid regime, is actually an, uh, also the formulator of the idea of self-determination. And he's actually the only person who has a signature in both the League of Nations and the United Nations preamble. Um, and nobody wants to talk about the fact that uh, normative basis of our current uh, nation state world order is built by imperialist and racist and settler colonialist. Um, you also uh, discuss how it was a dilemma for the colonized people that for their emancipation, they had to use these terms and concepts for um, for liberation. But since concepts themselves are actually uh, are hidden this white settler colonial racist uh, interest that we are still fa facing the same problems and dilemmas and some of our problems can be understood coming inherited from this um, settler colonial legacy um, this i think is is uh, perfectly complements the previous two lectures one we did with uh, professor Osama maktisi and adam getachev they exactly also deal with this issue of what are the roots of our current problem what is the what, how can we actually use history to find insights in critiquing the uh, current crisis of international order?
um, and find a way out of it. Uh, I'm already being, I have been receiving multiple great insightful questions. So I'm gonna uh, try to ask them chronologically. Um, but since uh, you refer to, uh, we have, we have uh, some questions from the Turkish audience. You refer to both the Greek War of Independence uh, that came out 200 years ago um, but also the Wilsonian moment a hundred years ago. Um, and one question that we have, of course, with the self-determination and the right to self-determination is that Turkish national anthem uh, written by a, a great poet named Mehmet Akif Ersoy. And, uh, and it seems there are two lines. Um, uh, uh, there are two lines in this poem. Uh, one line which uh, critiques the idea of uh, civilization so civilization is a monster without a tooth. So the, 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 the people who actually read your previous book might have a good insight on why that, that line exists in Turkish national anthem. The other one is, of course, it says, uh, uh, it says, independence is the right of my people that worship is right, God. Uh, so it, it is an interesting um, way of, of thinking through this this issue of, of self-determination. Um, maybe we start our conversation with this dilemma of the non-Western societies or the, the, the natives of different lands, and also people from like an Ottoman Empire coming from the cosmopolitan imperial background, um, that where, where the question of the settler who is a native is, is very ambivalent. And I think I'm now curious about your take on the Greek um, independence. Um, um, so how do we think of the, the experience of the people in the Ottoman and post-imperial lands, which are over, over, often overlooked in the history of nationalism, self-determination? How can we understand this history from the paradigm that you offer, um, such as uh, Greek independence? Um, by the way, I, I found your reference to Vatel fascinating, and I think that one international law a scholar asked this question is uh, with a comment that Vatel is, is the one of the first international history uh, textbook translated into um, um, into Ottoman in 1840s. Uh, by Tanzimat Edith, um, and precisely for the reason that they uh, did not, um, uh, they, they used Vatel to argue against the intervention by the European powers. Um, so, uh, what is this paradigm telling us about the Ottoman experience in the last 200 years? Ottoman and, -Ottoman experience. and by the way, there is one uh computer is it mine i don't think it's mine uh there, it makes an echo was it yours or mine i'm not sure i got the idea that i should reduce the volume of my second computer but i it is uh, i don't know what where it comes from um, I, I cannot hear an echo um okay well then maybe it's only me or some other people but uh, let's go back to the question the technical people the technology. Uh, um, so how how is this paradigm uh helping us to rethink the history of the region from Athens to Palestine um, in the last 200 years. Well, I mean, um, before I answer this, I just want to say that uh, Jan Smuts was the architect of a white supremacist South Africa, but not of apartheid. Apartheid would come in 1948, but that does not make him any less racist because the Union of South Africa was based on white supremacy nonetheless. Um, I just want to be technically correct on this question. Um, no, I think uh, 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 Greece and Palestine are actually um, important in this regard and a bit more unique uh, in, in the sense of how uh, they relate to Europe's uh, concept of its own civilization and civilizational history. After all, Europe, as it invented itself during the Renaissance, claims uh, the, the, it's, that its faith, its religion comes from Palestine and that its philosophical and rational tradition comes from Greece. So Greece and Palestine would become very, very important. And indeed, the quest to conquer Istanbul, Constantinople and Jerusalem would guide a lot of the uh, ideas of uh, reclaiming from the Muslims 
uh, uh, Jerusalem. Remember also the word liberation is actually a crusader word. The crusaders wanted to liberate Jerusalem from the infidel Muslims, right? So even when we use words like liberation today, they also have a colonial settler uh, origin that these crusaders who came to colonize and settle in Palestine for 200 years are the ones who came up with the term liberation. Um, but also Constantinople, of course, would be uh, a, a very important uh, target. Of course, the last attempt by the Greeks, uh, if not by the Russians, to take it over was in the early 1920s, as we know. And uh, that Greek aggression would precipitate a horrific and tragic uh, uh, population uh, displacement um, of uh, uh, Muslim Greeks and Christian Turks, which of course Greek nationalism would not define as such since uh, uh, Greek speaking Muslims were identified by Greek nationalism as Turks and Turkish speaking Christians were identified as Greeks. So uh, this uh, sort of, uh, and, and this is as late as the uh, 1920s and beyond, of course. Uh, 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 but in the case of Gre Greece is interesting in this regard because like in the case of Palestine, it would be a Greek diaspora intellectuals who would come up with the idea uh, that Greek should secede from uh, 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 the Ottoman Empire. They would fully partake not only of the racist Orientalism and anti-Muslim sentiment of Christian Europe, they not only would seek to unite themselves with Christian Europeans, but they also were beneficiaries of the rise of German Philhellenism, which spread all over Europe in the 18th century and imagined Greece then. Uh, I mean, if, 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 if the Protestant Reformation imagined Palestine as the origin of European faith, then uh, Philhellenism of the, a century later would imagine uh, 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 ancient Greece as the origin of this Europe. So the abduction of Palestine and Greece from the Eastern Mediterranean, from the Middle East, if you will, into Europe, uh, in the case of Greece, taking it fully into uh, Europe by extending European uh, borders, in the case of Palestine, bringing European col colonists to take it over and to claim that they have built a villa in the jungle, as uh, one of their prime ministers uh, uh, you know, had said in, in, in recent years. So um, what's interesting is, in fact, that uh, in the case of the Greeks, you have all these uh, Paris-based or uh, uh, even uh, Russia-based, uh, St. Petersburg-based uh, uh, and Moscow-based uh, Greek uh, intellectuals and uh, activists and Odessa-based, of all places, uh, uh, movement who would um, uh, carry uh, the banner of uh, Greek secessionism, uh, which would later be called independence. Of course, there was no word for independence in Greek. It was invented in the 1820s, uh, taken from uh, English and French, um, and used in that regard as a direct uh, uh, translation from this new notion uh, that emerged in the 18th century and of which I spoke earlier. Um, Odessa is interesting in this regard, of course. Uh, um, Catherine the Great had conquered uh, the northern parts of the Ottoman Empire around the Black Sea, including uh, the area uh, uh, around the uh, Crimean Peninsula, and uh, what, she, what she would uh, name uh, subsequently as uh, uh, New Russia. And there it would, uh, on, on, on the ruins of the Ottoman uh, city of Haji Bey, it would build, she would build a colonial settler a city called Odessa, where she invited European colonists from all over Europe, but also uh, from all over Russia, to come and uh, uh, colonize it, including Greeks. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Russian Jews who had been added to Russia after the conquest of Poland. Uh, but in the case of Odessa, uh, it would become uh, the, the first intellectual hub of those who would call for Greek secessionism uh, in the early part of the 19th century, just as in, at the end of that century, uh, Odessa would house the major European or Russian Jewish uh, activists who would also talk about Jewish nationalism and Zionism um, and the conquest of Palestine. So in both cases, you have sort of diasporas. In the case of Greece, of course, its first prime minister, as people would know, was uh, uh, Cappadostrias, who was born in uh, Corfu uh, under Venetian rule, had never uh, and had worked as the foreign minister of the Tsar at the time for, for about two decades. He had never been to the area which would become independent Greece uh, 
in the late 1820s. In fact, he set foot in it for the first time to become prime minister, circa 1828. And of course, Greek independence would, uh, as all independent people would choose, a German king to lead uh, uh, the new nation um, uh, into the era of independence. Uh, so it's a, the, the, the Greek uh, movement is very interesting, especially because of how many of these diaspora intellectuals will come exactly as uh, 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 would happen in the case of Palestine. And most of these Greeks uh, uh, you know, originate from families that had left three or four centuries earlier. You know, God knows how they relate to the, themselves aside from the patronym to uh, a Greek heritage. Yet the idea of return, the idea of controlling the new Greece would be very, very important and linking it to the emergent uh, Europe. So in that sense, you know, what becomes independence in Greece, of course, you know, even the word in uh, uh, Turkish derived from Arabic at the time, istiklal, did not really mean except secession. It's an old word from the uh, Abbasid period um, of new states that seceded from the, you know, from the caliphate. It would only, in Arabic, uh, come to conjure up the meaning of independence um, by the early 1880s in Egypt, you know, with, with the Ahmad Gharabi uh, revolt against British occupation um, uh, and control. So even the notion in Arabic, for example, of istiqlal as independence is a late 19th century notion. It takes a while to come in, just as the term self-determination would enter in the early 1920s as a translation of the French not of the English, Haq Taqrir al Masir, which is uh, uh, interesting, uh, except in, in, in one sense where uh, 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 generally I think uh, in, in, in French it's, it's about uh, uh, determining one's fate as opposed to one's destiny, uh, which is a very interesting thing uh, uh, in terms of the, the Arabic only has destiny and not fate. Uh, Masir uh, uh, is important in this regard. All right, so the, the, the point is that in, in, in the case of the uh, so-called Greek independence, they saw themselves as part of, they wanted to add themselves to this new Europe. It's, it's, they were transformed, if you will, from Ottoman natives into European settlers overnight uh, of, their, you know, of, of, of the Ottoman Empire that needed to be to secede uh, from it. So um, I, I go through much of the history on the arguments that were put forth um, at the time. And of course, as we know, there's lots of uh, uh, Greek intellectual resistance to this anti-Ottomanism um, of the last 200 years of, of Greek, uh, uh, of the, the ruling Greek nationalist ideology. Um, that question it a lot more, say, than uh, there is a questioning of uh, Zionism uh, among Israeli intellectuals, uh, uh, for that matter. Uh, but yeah, so we, we, we see also here that the, the Christian aspect becomes important, even though it's not Protestant. It is somehow uh, added and annexed to Protestantism because German Philhellenism, in fact, claimed that the Teutonic languages, the Germanic languages, are much closer to ancient Greek than they are to the Latin of French or Italian or Spanish. So, uh, uh, and uh, the Protestants would consider Greek and German and English, of course, as Protestant languages in that sense. So in, in a certain way, Greece became Protestant in the European imaginary, which is why I remember that the earlier fighting brigades from Europe and volunteers, even from the US, went to help the Greeks because of the debt Europe felt it owed the ancient Greeks. Uh, uh, to pay it back. Of course, when they encountered them, they were very concerned that they looked too Turkish and they thought that perhaps they were not actually the descendants of uh, uh, Aristotle or Plato, but might have been just Christianized uh, and Hellenized Slavs who moved from the north to the south and they, they could not be the real descendants of the Greeks. And the racist European uh, take on the Greeks, of course, is you know horrific in this regard. Well, uh, uh, there are. I'm collecting questions, and um, uh, so if you haven't read your question, I will read them. So I'm I'm telling people who already sent the questions. But since you mentioned this uh, crucial point of Greek and Arab and Palestinian um, question, um, there there is a question about how this paradigm help us rethink the transition uh, in the Middle East from 1914 to 1924. Uh, because um, 
uh, in, in our first conversation with Professor Maktisi, he was saying that uh, the Arab lands were, were the last places to be colonized, but colonized in the name of self-determination and religious tolerance. Um, after World War One, in fact, there were attempts by uh, many Arabs to find a federation. This idea of a Turkish Arab federation was very common. Indian Muslims were supporting that, that idea, uh, but Europeans insisted that they will give Arabs their self-determination. Uh, it's a very, you can see, I think very clearly with your paradigm, how it's effective in the sense that self-determination and independence is used as a colonial um, ideology. So um, how should we rethink that uh, the formation of the modern Middle East from your perspective, especially with regard to the transition of, of, of the period from World War I to um, 1924, and, and especially in light of the given the fact that uh, uh, Greeks gained, so-called gained their independence from Turkey, and the Turks gained their independence from Greeks, so there is a sort of hundred year gap. But uh, since um, you're familiar with this geography of the post-Ottoman Greeks, many of the Arab, uh, great Arab thinkers were also Orthodox Christians. So they, we could also think of, of their the kind of um, orphans of that uh, partition of Turkey and Greece, you know, where they are left behind from the Ottoman Empire and they have to rethink their own position. There's something but, also curious. But, but remember, all the Orthodox uh, 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 Christians in, in the Arab, at least in, in the uh, greater Syria, uh, had fought against the Greek uh, patriarchate. Of course, um, yes. One, one of the most interesting things, of course, is that uh, it was the Ottomans who imposed the Greek patriarch on Palestine. Exactly. Until, exactly. until the middle of the 16th century, Palestine had uh, the Orthodox patriarch was Patriarch Atallah, who once he died, uh, he was replaced by the Patriarch Germanus by the Ottomans, who immediately moved the uh, uh, office of the patriarchate from Jerusalem to Constantinople and created a fraternity of uh, Greek uh, 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 priests uh, which, from which the Arabs and the Palestinians were, or the, or the, the Arab inhabitants of Palestine at the time, were excluded. And as you know, there would be a huge amount of uh, 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 uprisings against the Greek patriarchate, against the racism of the Greek clergy, against the Arab Christians, whether in Syria itself, uh, especially the Patriarch of Antioch or of Jerusalem um, that would culminate by the late yeah. 19th century in a successful uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, overthrow of the Greek Patriarch of Antioch and replacing him by a Syrian and the failure of the Palestinians in the late 19th century to overthrow their Patriarch, which once World War I uh, arrived, the British would immediately endorse the Greek patriarch who supported the Balfour Declaration and Zionism. And then after 1948, when Palestine was divided, also the Jordanians, uh, the Jordanian regime would also support the usurping Greek patriarch as the and, and as would the Israelis. So there was always a big struggle. On the one hand, there's a commonality of a denominational uh, affiliation with the Greeks, but that was imposed as a result of the Ottomans. Um, um, th there was, of course, also, you know, uh, people sometimes don't realize that the Crimean War was really be began, you know, related to Palestine yes, and to sure. Palestine's holy places, right? And the idea that the, 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 the Crusaders wanted to come back and be granted uh, again concessions in Palestinian holy places. And the fight began to be on the one hand between uh, the, the Latin and uh, uh, Catholic and, and, and Protestant uh, uh, colonials, basically. And on the other hand, you have the Palestinian laity who are against the Greek uh, clergy, but together they were fighting the Catholics and the Protestants who were trying to exact concessions and take away the Palestine's holy places. So um, uh, there were some sympathies and some not by Palestinian and other Arab Christians um, uh, to Greece. Remember, the majority of Greek-speaking uh, Ottomans did not support the Greek struggle for independence for the next hundred years. Um, uh, so in that sense, and remember, after 1923, that the horrible displacement um, uh, of uh, uh, Christian Ottomans to uh, Greece a lot of them were actually became colonial settlers in Macedonia in the north. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that sense, also you know, those areas 
that independent Greece insisted were Greek were becoming majority Greek through the colonization by the resettlement of those displaced uh, 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 Christian uh, Ottomans who had become Greek as a result of the Greek aggression on uh, the Ottoman Empire or on Turkey after the war. So, um, uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, there's a very sort of rich history to look into. Now, in terms of um, 1914 to 1924, that might affect perhaps greater Syria, but not North Africa. You have to realize that settler colonialism in the in in, in Arab speaking areas uh, went from. Uh, aside from the early settler colonialism, Spanish settler colonialism in northern Morocco, you have uh, basically Algeria from 1830, uh, the 1880, early 1880s in Tunisia, um, you have from 1911 Italy, um, and, and, and you have Palestine. You have four European settler colonies, right? So the Algeria, the French killed uh, one third of the Algerian population by 1871, uh, one million people already were killed. Uh, the, the Italians by 1930 had killed two thirds of all Libyans between 1911 and 1930. Uh, and remember, uh, Italy was colonized by liberal Italian governments, not by uh, Mussolini, who yeah. continued the colonization. Um, so, in that sense, you have uh, all these things are before begin well before World War One. Now, of course, things changed considerably. Um, in Syria, in greater Syria, um, because of the so-called promise of self-determination was uh, for the Arab nation. Wilson granted this for the Arabs, but not for Syrians or for Egyptians. When the Egyptians and the Syrians tried to meet with Wilson at the Paris Peace Conference and sent letters and delegates, he refused to give them the light of the, the light of day. He refused completely to acknowledge that they had any. Um, uh, right to self-determination, especially as they were under British and French uh, uh, control. What he did uh, recognize is the Arabs, meaning the Hashemites, with whom the deal was concluded between the British and the Hashemite family of Hejaz at that time, about staging a revolt against the Ottomans in support of Europe to uh, presumably bring about the independence of the Arab provinces. Uh, so in that sense, you had two competing nationalism a Western-friendly Hashemite nationalism, if you will, that was anti-Ottoman, and the traditional pro-Ottoman or Ottoman-identified uh, uh, political movement that was uh, inimical to uh, European conquest. Um, uh, so uh, the transformation, of course, was huge in terms of uh, uh, the end of the Caliphate in 1924 and the Lausanne, uh, uh, the signing of the Lausanne Treaty it changed, you know, the identities, the demographics, the borders, um, and uh, systematized uh, settler colonialism in the case of Palestine uh, uh, in ways that it had not been systematized prior. Uh, to World War One, um, and as a result, the promise of independence, you know, when the mandates were set up, uh, uh, the mandate for Iraq, of course, was never ratified, which is why they decided, uh, the British decided to give it a semblance of independence in 1931, whereas in Syria and Lebanon, the mandates, of course, uh, uh, specified that these people would become independent in the future, and that would have applied to Palestine, except that, of course, the mandate uh, uh, included within it the provisions of the Balfour Declaration, um, which, of course, were in contradiction with its provisions to give the people that are being governed yeah. you know, the right to self-determination and the right to independence. Um, I'm not sure I answered your question. I wasn't. No, sure no, this is great. I mean, I, you know, the anniversary of the Lausanne Treaty is coming up next year, so I, I hope that we can have you in in Turkey to to rethink uh, the implications of Lausanne Treaty because. Until the very last minute, I think uh, both uh, of the Arab and the Turkish uh, intellectual and political activists are actually thinking uh, outside of these frameworks. So they try to resist. Um, they try to resist the imposition of this ethnic nationalism and idea of self-determination because they see they can see through the colonial implications of the mandate. Uh, but it, what what does become very clear, and I think your paradigm helps us to understand this, is that. European powers don't leave any other option on the table. They are really against uh, the idea that people can go back to their cosmopolitan imperial framework. Uh, they don't want, so they use all of the moral language of self-determination to justify colonialism and then uh, pressure the delegation in Lausanne not to do anything on Balfour or Palestinians. So they, 
it seems that this book is going to be a very timely for the anniversary of the Lausanne Treaty to understand what was happening behind the Lausanne Treaty. Of course, in terms of the Palestinian demands, because Palestinians were asking the Turkish delegation um, uh, to not sign the, 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 the Ottoman Empire's rights over Palestine, because Palestinians were free citizens of a state. They were not colonial subjects. So they actually then became colonized in the name of self-determination. I think this paradigm... And, really and this applied to, I mean, remember that legal, the, the mandate system had two major, included two major settler colonies. Uh, Namibia, which was a German settler colony, uh, which of course the Germans lost after World War One, and it was given to Jan Smuts to South Africa to administer, yeah. and uh, and Palestine, uh, which was the uh, which became the European Jewish settler colony under British sponsorship. There were a few other settler colonies in the South Pacific, some small islands, you know, places like New Guinea, for example, which the uh, uh, New Zealand took over the mandate. For, although it was not a big, it didn't settle a huge amount of white settler colonists. But what was interesting, of course, after World War I, is that the white settler colonies now were acquiring their own settler colonies. So yeah. a settler colony like South Africa acquired uh, uh, Namibia. A settler colony like New Zealand acquired uh, 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 New Guinea, uh, Western Samoa and Australia, um, uh, Etc. So you and, and of course, uh, 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 in this case, you have uh, an expansion of the sense of uh, independence of these settler colonies uh, do after no. uh, World War One that they did not have, and also, of course, the introduction and or the generalization of the notion of dominion amongst the British settler colonies, which had been only granted really to Canada in the 19th century and to the Union of South Africa in 1910. Now, suddenly, uh, 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 the dominion status would be expanded, would be better uh, uh, defined, and was exclusive, of course, to uh, the white settler colonists. This would only change um, uh, after World War II, when uh, dominion status would be extended to other non-white uh, uh, settler societies, namely uh, uh, sort of India and Sri Lanka and Pakistan, but also Ghana, which would become the first uh, African uh, yeah. dominion and part of the Commonwealth. Um, I, I'm collecting questions, but uh, let me read one from Hassan Karatash from Istanbul Technical University. Uh, it says, thank you for a wonderful talk. It helped me understand Turkish modernization under a new light. Within the framework you suggested, is it possible to see the westernizing reforms of the late Ottoman and early Republican Turkey as a survival strategy? In other words, would the Turkish elites have thought that only by mimicking Western customs, including self-determination, that they will be seemed worthy of independence and self-determination? And then he has a second question will be about the role of liberal public opinion, since you wrote a book on liberalism and Islam within colonial empires. Would you agree that they were vulnerable to manipulation by imperial administration to further their local and global goals? Um, I, I'm just reading the questions. I, I, I guess you can take any aspect of the question you would like to take. Uh, uh, let me see. I'm trying to, first of all, uh, let me correct myself. I, I misspoke. Australia, of course, uh, was in control of New Guinea and New Zealand of Western Samoa, just to correct yeah. in terms of the mandate system. Uh, but uh, what I, uh, in terms of uh, uh, Turkey, um, I mean, you begin to see this, of course, I mean, the, the survival mode of the Ottoman Empire begins earlier before the Republic uh, uh, sort of comes to be. Um, and, in the, and in the sense of uh, Turkey, it's, it's very interesting because what you have, I mean, between basically uh, 1820 uh, and, uh, you know, the, the World War I, the end of World War I, you have about six million Muslim refugees expelled by Christian nationalists from across uh, uh, Eastern Europe and the Balkans to what becomes Turkey. And uh, about 5 million Muslims are killed, beginning with the Greek massacres of 15,000 uh, Muslim Greeks in the Morea, or the Peloponnese, as it came to be known. So, um, I mean, the Greeks began a kind of a, uh, the Greek nationalists began a, a kind of massacres, a type of, of, of sectarian massacres, unprecedented in terms of scale. And of course, the Ottomans responded in, in equal, if not you know, more brutality of massacres, for example, in Chios uh, subsequently. Yeah. But these sectarian 
uh, uh, massacres begin as a result of this secessionist Christian European centric uh, uh, in increasingly uh, you know Phil Hellenistic Byzantine identified uh, Constantinople uh, uh, nostalgic uh, type of uh, nationalism that saw even Greek Muslims as Turks who you know deserved to be massacred in that sense. Um, so uh, that begins a kind of a serious, as a result, I think the Republic in Turkey now had millions of Muslims who are not uh, uh, even Turkish speaking, right? And uh, therefore a national program sort of was started, uh, if you will, to Turkify a lot of these refugees, um, uh, whether, you know, uh, uh, Greeks, Arabs, or Bulgarians, or uh, 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 Romanians, or Serbians, or Bosnians, or Circassians, or et cetera. Uh, so in that sense, uh, yes, it was a kind of a survival mode uh, that, of course, uh, uh, submitted to the national and nationalist principle, if you will, um, uh, especially after the uh, break in the alliance between the communists uh, and the nationalists in Turkey. Remember, of course, uh, the, the, the quest for a Christian, even Orthodox conquest of Constantinople would continue until, uh, uh, until the Russian Revolution. It was only then when Lenin said, absolutely, Constantinople shall remain Muslim and the Russian revolutionaries have nothing to do with the Tsarist plans to take it over. So it was then for the first time that a, a Russian leader in the, in the new Soviet Union that um, uh, uh, decided to completely forsake the quest uh, uh, to conquer Constantinople. But, uh, but you know, as you know, uh, within a few years, the, 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 the Greeks uh, 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 were uh, trying uh, to conquer it until yeah. the British stopped them around Constantinople. And, and so the Greek nationalism in that sense, uh, uh, Unlike what would happen after World War One, of course, with the rise of Greek communism and the importance of the, the progressive uh, uh, forces within Greek society uh, that would be, of course, horribly and savagely suppressed by the British and the Americans by the late 1940s uh, in favor of a kind of a fascist restoration, if you yeah. will. Your uh, new book, uh, I think, is also going to help us to change how we teach and understand the 19th century history of decolonization and independence and sovereignty. Uh, we have David Armitage's book that uh, tells about the declaration of independence and sovereignty as a kind of spreading from American. Uh, I, I, I quote him and, and engage him in my book. Yeah, so I think I'm, I will I'm look forward to reading it because you offer a very different perspective on it. So instead of taking the declaration of independence of the United States as a liberation or emancipation, you're also arguing that no, this was uh, in some sense, my colleague in the department, uh, Captain Duval, wrote a book called Independence Lost for Native Americans. Um, American Revolution was not an emancipation, it was a colonization. Um, and from... And the Declaration of Independence was never called a Declaration of Independence, in fact. Uh, so it was yes. a Declaration of 13 colonies now, now sitting or something to that effect. It was never called until today, in fact, contrary to what most Americans believe. It has never been called officially. The Declaration of Independence. So, it's, and this applies to, I mean, Israel claims that its declaration of the establishment of the state of Israel is a declaration of independence. Not true. In fact, people, Zionists proposed that the declaration be called a declaration of independence, but the council refused because to call Israel independent would mean it would be independent of world Jews, world Jewry, which it refused to be. Mm -hmm. So they refused. <coughs> They refused to use the term independent or even sovereign because that would separate them from the Zionist quest that all European, that this is a state for all Jews around the world and not only for Israeli Jews. So the idea of a declaration of independence being called that, it is not either in the case of Israel or in the US, right? So it's very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I think now, now looking back, then all the uh, independence or sovereign or uh, movements in the long 19th century were either by white settler colonials against uh, indigenous populations. Except Haiti. Except Haiti, one exception. Or, and, and the African-American colonists, settler yes. colonists of Liberia. Liberia. Or, or, as we talked about, is Greece, Bulgaria, Serbia, 
these are uh, not necessarily nation states. Uh, these are states with their own alternative visions of a kingdom. Uh, you know, Greece has a, uh, at first a German, then a Danish, British. Uh, a, a Danish king until 1974. Yes. Um, so th there is actually no Asian and African country that is not white or Christian that actually gained independence, uh, with a couple of small exceptions. Well, I, I mean, I mean, is, the exceptions are important, right? Because what, what you have after the American Revolution is, or during the American Revolution, the, the black uh, slaves uh, or enslaved people who fought with the British were rewarded by being moved to Nova Scotia and were promised land, which was never given to them. It was given to the white loyalists. And then they were shipped to colonize Sierra Leone along with uh, uh, Protestant missionaries. Because Protestantism would become very important in the colonization of Palestine, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and what becomes known as New Zealand. So in addition to Sierra Leone, of course, then the American Colonization Association creates Liberia which becomes independent in the late 1840s. Around the same time, the white settlers of uh, uh, New Zealand um, uh, decide, uh, uh, or the, a British conqueror decides to have the Maori tribes, or some of them, uh, come to him. He writes for them a declaration of independence uh, so that the French uh, or other powers would not take over New Zealand that it would be preserved for the British. So they declare independence in 1840, and um, after which they sign a treaty with the British where the, they cede their sovereignty to the British so as to protect them from the possibility of French conquest. So you have the Maori independence, which is really not an independence at all in 1840. You have the 1847, I believe, uh, if I'm not wrong, on the year, Liberian independence, which was also uh, concern about French um, and uh, British uh, territorial designs on the lands of Liberia. Liberia was, of course, uh, the, the property of the American Colonization Association and not of the U.S. government. And therefore, it needed to become sovereign to defend itself, which is why it became independent. And of course, uh, it was also a racialist system where African-American colonists set themselves up as the colonial settlers with privileges over the native Africans of the region whom they fought a colonial war uh, uh, with for the next century and a half. So, um, yes, but, uh, but the independence then was basically the English settler colonies that got economic, if you will, as well as political independence. Um, and the, uh, you know, the, the uh, what, what is called sort of the mestizo uh, uh, independence of uh, much of Latin America. Yeah. Um, but of course, the real independence struggle of a non-white people at the time uh, that, that succeeded in overthrowing uh, 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 colonialism as well as slavery would be uh, Saint-Domingue, the colored yeah. and of Saint-Domingue, uh, which would declare Haiti in January uh, 1804. But they will be punished for the next hundred years for doing so, right? That's well, even the present, the, until today. What do you mean the next hundred yeah, years? That's true. Next two hundred um, years. <laughs> I mean, the, the, so the tragedy is this: is, is that I, when we think of the nineteenth-century history from your perspective, uh, that you uh, very persuasively shown the illusion, the lies behind the claim for emancipation, liberalism, and you even in the previous book you show how. America claims to be democracy for 200 years, even though it was, it was a, a destructive of settler colonialism. It was a racism. So I, based on your writing, I teach my students. So, and, and then your tests actually um, always vindicated. Our students, too, they think America was a democracy for 200 years. And then when you question them, they realize, no, it wasn't, right, until Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, you could not call this a democracy. But similarly, the self-determination is a form of settler colonialism. It becomes very clear. The, the question that uh, that I think some of the, the, the audiences are also asking me consistently uh, are, are saying that um, there were alternative ideas, uh, such as Ottomanism, Arab Ottomanism, right? That you insist on living together um, within an imperial, reformed imperial framework. So why are these um, uh, the, ba the bad racist colonialist settler colonial ideas? Why did they defeat the, the better model of uh, some sort of uh, 
free coexistence of, of different ethnic groups and nationalities, not only in the broader Middle East, but also in different parts of Asia, that in some ways yeah. ideas won over, over 150 years, and then anti-colonial nationalists thought that that's the only tool available to them. How can, how can we understand this? Well, it was not a battle of ideas, you see, right? It was an actual war. Right. So it's not like these ideas won out and suddenly a new group was uh, that held a specific idea was elected. They, you know, people were militarily conquered by European armies, as was the entire uh, uh, Middle East. Remember that the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916 um, had divided the region amongst three powers, basically. Uh, I mean, two nominally, but a third as well. So on the one hand, France was going to get uh, uh, Lebanon and uh, uh, Syria. And of course, there was the question of Palestine. This is why the Balfour Declaration was, you know, people were very concerned that France wanted to restore its crusader sort of uh, history to Palestine, and the British wanted to rush to take it over before the French took it over. And, and sykes Pico, Palestine and Iraq and France, Jordan, uh, become sort of the, 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 the share of the British. But let's not forget the Russians. The Tsar wanted Constantinople. So had it not been for the Russian Revolution, it would have been the Russians who would now, who would have then occupied Constantinople and restored, you know, a Byzantium yeah. uh, as uh, 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 the, the Russian czars and the Greek nationalists, Orthodox nationalists, had wanted uh, for so long. I should, I should actually remind, uh, uh, perhaps um, our listeners may not know, that even the term Byzantium is a term invented by the Germans, really, in the 19th century. It had no currency before. Yeah. right? Even, even the, so what existed there was simply the Roman Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire. It, it just called itself the Roman Empire. So calling it Byzantium is actually a German and European imperial imperial nomenclature that it never used for itself. And suddenly now we all use it, you know, as, as, as the uh, uh, reference point uh, yeah. for us. But um, so in that sense, uh, the conquest and of course, you know, the, the British end up being in, 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 and the uh, uh, Italians in, uh, uh, in, in the Ottoman Empire, in, in Turkey yeah. and, and the, you know, uh, the islands off the coast, etc. Uh, all of this was done through military conquest, not through the conquest of ideas, although, of course, there was already about 150 years of uh, uh, in increasing hegemony of European ideas within the Ottoman Empire, as well, of course, uh, in, in the case of Syria, um, uh, since the 1830s, of Protestant missionary activity across uh, uh, the region, uh, as well as in Egypt, which also implanted new ideas and ways of understanding um, uh, one's subjectivity in relation to uh, the state, in relation to uh, society more generally, uh, and to modernity. Um, on that point, I, I have a very uh, good question about um, by Bilantos Chilik is asking that you provide a new way of thinking about how the the surface of the war, so surface of the earth is restructured politically uh, into national unit. And uh, the dilemma of the colonized people is that they have to use the language um, of the settler colonialists to get rid of imperialism. So that goes into the post-World War II period. Um, what can you say more about this dilemma of why did this settler colonial language then became the most dominant form of language uh, of the demands of national independence after World War II? I mean, I, I, mean, I think Fanon uh, has done a much better job than I could ever do in, uh, uh, in responding to in critiquing what happened. Uh, you know, and, and as did uh, Lenin in that regard and, and in his famous debate with uh, uh, Luxembourg on the question of nationalism and self-determination. And remember that the reversal of settler colonialism in uh, the Soviet Union was a, a very much part of the instituted policy from the immediately after 1917. And Lenin was very, very concerned about uh, Russian chauvinism. And he, he would say, you know, if, if you scratch a Russian communist, you would find the Russian chauvinists you know, at the time, which is why he in insisted on the institution of new uh, political mechanisms to decolonize and stop the colonization of the Asian parts and the, and the Caucasus. And indeed, uh, 
uh, there were risings that even uh, targeted and killed Russian settlers, which uh, were allowed in the early 1920s uh, in the Soviet Union. But uh, soon, of course, the idea of equality, those who had been there for a while were granted equality and no more colonial settler privileges were given to Russians or the few Ukrainians and Belarusians who had also uh, been there. Um, in terms of uh, 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 sort of uh, an understanding of uh, uh, the use of the language of settler colonialism, I, th I think this is very much part of the ruse that I speak about, right? So on the one hand, you have uh, the socialist tradition of self-determination beginning in the late 19th century in the 1890s, precisely to uh, 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 make sure we are not co-opted into ideas of uh, uh, the, you know, the, the supremacist nationalism of European nations. Wilson co-opts this very, very quickly. Right? He, he, and this is something, for example, which Manella's book uh, does not tell us. Mm -hmm. But in fact, this is all, it all comes from uh, uh, the socialist tradition, from the major debate and articles that Lenin had written in 1911, Rosa Luxemburg, and, 1908, which continue through 1917. And the idea after the Russian Revolution triumphed, the concern was that the Soviets were giving, uh, were, were presenting a new model by uh, talking about self determination, which through the uh, common turn was now going all over Asia with Indian and Indonesian and Turkish representatives going to the common turn, hearing about the, 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 the commitment of the new Soviet state self determination. That whole idea came in as part of the anti-communist competition and at the same time to preserve the rights of white colonists. So what happened is after World War I and after uh, uh, the, the, the peace conference uh, in Paris, what you have is indeed the hegemony of the Wilsonian understanding, which many people mistook as the Leninist understanding. So you have nationalists in Egypt, nationalists in Palestine, misunderstanding and thinking that Wilson, Wilson's notion is equal to Lenin's. And since Wilson was more powerful, they appealed to Wilson, who, of course, uh, spurned them and snubbed them, uh, uh, refused that. We see this repeated again after 1941, after the Atlantic Charter, which Roosevelt and uh, 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 Winston Churchill sign, um, and in which, again, Churchill uh, says and explains that in the, the Atlantic Charter, we promised self-determination to the peoples of the defeated empires after World War II and not of the victorious empires, exactly what happened after World War I, which is why you, know, the, you would not offer self-determination to British colonies or the French colonies, only to the former German colonies or Russian colonies. Yeah. For so um, all Ottoman colonies, hence the idea of, of, of supporting self-determination there. The Atlantic Charter would also be uh, misadopted. Tunisians and Algerians fighting for liberation would use it. Uh, South African blacks would use and invoke the, the charter as if it applied to them. When, uh, again, misunderstanding that this is not the Leninist notion. The Leninist notion would actually uh, become triumphant at the United Nations between 1960 and 1970 with the accession to membership of a large number of African and Asian independent states. At that time, you begin to see all kinds of new resolutions that advance what we might see as Lenin's understanding of independence rather than the Wilsonian term. It is immediately hijacked at the first opportunity in 1970 by the United States government, um, who uh, has a sort of a, adds a clause to the, the, the to resolutions that support self-determination, that insist that uh, the, the sovereignty of existing states and its unity cannot be questioned. And therefore, we see a restoration of the Wilsonian and colonial understanding of self-determination reigning supreme. That is when the Israelis begin to use it. The Israelis never used it before. They were not interested in self-determination, hardly ever. It becomes part of their language in the 1970s. That's also when they recognize the Palestinians. Once you sever the connection between land and community, then the, the, the colonials are no longer threatened. If you want to be called yourself a nation, we have no problem. You can claim you have your own lovely dances and lovely food. None of this entitles you to your to land at all, right? Mm -hmm. So when you sever the connection between you sanguinis and uh, you solely, that is when the colonials 
recognize you as a nation, mm. but only with this new oh. revamped definition of self-determination. And and th there was a question on indigenous rights. So uh, they want you to clarify what you think about this new move to move from uh, uh, the idea of self-determination and independence to give um, people just indigenous rights. Um, uh, and then there, there is also, I, I think I can observe, that there's a use of the indigeneity and, and uh, among different oppressed people, including Palestinians. Um, and then also, uh, I just uh, found out from some of my students who gave a presentation, uh, Jewish American students, that um, some of the Zionists found the indigeneity language too threatening. So they began to invent or claim indigeneity by doing blood tests to claim that but remember, this is very interesting to, to, to put in perspective, because in the case of Zionism, there's the claim that there is something unique about Zionism. The Palestinians also think that their situation is unique. It's not, actually. I will show in the book, which has a global sort of range, how similar it is. On the one hand, for example, the Zionists claim that unlike other colonialists, allegedly European Jews came 2,000 years ago from Palestine. Of course, as we know from all the history books and all the factual evidence available, European Jews, like European Christians, are converts to Judaism, mm -hmm. like European Christians are converts to Christianity. But the point is the argument that they are returning to their land, which is actually theirs, is not new. We've heard this already from France when it, when it invaded uh, Algeria in 1830. The French said, we are the Romans. Mm -hmm. We are coming to our land. This is our land. When the Italians conquered Italy, the same thing. They said, we are taking back our land. We are the indigenous people of Libya. They renamed it Libya. Remember, Libya today goes by an Italian name. It was never called Libya. This is an ancient Roman name that was never used by the Ottomans or anybody else, right? So in any case, so Libya also became, the Italians claimed, we are returning to our Roman Ancest ancestral land. You are the encroachers. You are the colonists. Uh, the French would say the Arabs are the ones who came after we left, after the Romans left. Of course, they forget that many of the Roman emperors were also, of course, Arab originally, as, as if the Arabs were not part of the Roman Empire, uh, uh, but, uh, but allegedly the Gauls were. So it's very interesting in this regard uh, 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 to see this. So the idea of returning to the land that we came from here is not in any way you know, particularly or peculiarly a Zionist invention. On the contrary, the Zionists borrowed all of their ideas. They're so uncreative in their colonial claims, they just borrow them from the French or the Italians uh, or the British or the Portuguese, mind you. For example, the, the, the bogus claim that Zionists always put up that uh, they want to throw us in the sea is actually taken from the Portuguese empire who claimed that people who were uh, 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 in Namibia and Angola were revolting, th uh, that they wanted to throw the Europeans in the sea. Long before the Zionists made that you know, a, a, a bogus claim, mm -hmm. you already hear it from other imperial uh, contexts. So what you see is in fact a, a very uniform type of argumentation, uniform type of policies with regards to rights to land versus to culture, uh, similar policies in terms of the denial of nationhood, um, and how these particular notions, which seem progressive on the face of them, like independence, like settler colonialism, like liberation, are in fact, were invented by settler colonists uh, against the colonized for their own benefits. Of course, this doesn't mean they did not move in different ways and take on progressive uh, causes uh, for the achievement of real independence um, economically and politically, except that it was never achieved anywhere around the globe, right? I mean, the, the Americas were indebted to, you know, the, 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 the Hispanic America was indebted until today as a result of uh, the arrangement. The Greeks continued to pay uh, uh, their loans until after World War I. Um, uh, the Haitians had to pay back their indemnities until World War II yeah. from the 1830s onwards. So um, in that sense, uh, the only people who seem to uh, uh, unlike, for example, the Haitians, whom the French said, you have to pay us an indemnity because you took our slaves and our lands, uh, the Americans are the ones who asked the British for an indemnity. So, so white settlers ask for an indemnity from the mother country, whereas the mother country asks the former slaves 
for an indemnity. It's a very interesting contrast uh, uh, in that regard. Um, uh, and, you know, in, in the case of Israel, uh, uh, you have basically the indemnity is the reparations that are not paid for the actual victims of Nazism, but for the state of Israel, which, of course, yeah. did not exist during the Nazi regime and was not a victim of the Nazi regime. European yeah. Jews were the victims of the Nazi regime. So in that sense, uh, who gets to pay indemnities and who gets to pocket them uh, is very much racially defined. Uh, the only exceptions, like I said, from the, all the English settler colonies are South Africa and Israel, uh, both British uh, mm -hmm. uh, sponsored, but they're the only exceptions with uh, in terms of having uh, during South Africa's white rule mm -hmm. uh, today in Israel, both a kind of a political and a if you will, a, 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 an economic independence that uh, certainly Latin American uh, settler states lack. Yeah. Well, that um, beautifully leads us to uh, the last question that I want to ask from uh, uh, Professor Shafak Oz. Uh, since you mentioned indemnity, uh, he's asking, uh, we talked about uh, in the previous uh, session on reparations, the question of reparations to deal with the legacy of racism and inequality. Um, she, uh, he's asking that given that you offer an alternative paradigm that denaturalizes the nation state and shatters this, this narrative of decolonization um, and self-determination, what, what, what does this uh, decolonizing paradigm uh, imply for the activists and the movements today? What, um, what implications does your uh, new perspective have for our contemporary analysis and the political visions today? Um, I mean, I think, uh, for example, on the notion of self-determination, I show clearly that native peoples around the world have lost. Um, a liberal understanding of what had happened is that there was a gain as to what had existed before, but the gain was uh, 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 established uh, by forsaking uh, any more of their rights, right? So mm -hmm. being given a, a very small portion of your rights, which does not sacrifice uh, colonial uh, thefts, uh, mm -hmm. is hardly a major gain. This is like South Africa. There's this exchange. You will get to vote politically, but you won't get to control uh, all the wealth that we stole from you. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, South African uh, blacks and non-whites have learned the hard way in the last uh, 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 20 years or so, uh, or 26 years, 27 years now, that they have become poorer under free South Africa than they had been under apartheid South Africa. Uh, political independence has meant very little to the majority of poor South Africans, whose lives have become far worse than uh, uh, they had been uh, before. Uh, this is not an argument for apartheid. It's an argument about uh, how the end of apartheid had to be both economic and political. That in fact, what had happened now is a worse kind of apartheid uh, than uh, in, in certain ways than had existed uh, previously. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, the Palestinians who constantly clamor for something called self-determination seem not to realize that uh, they've already gotten it as far as the West is concerned. That self-determination for them is simply what the Israelis have been offering since, uh, and the Zionists since the late 1920s. Control over their garbage collection, over um, uh, the transportation system, not even over the school curricula, which the Zionists always uh, try to police, lest it says something against Israel. Uh, not in their media or in their police, but at least in certain kinds of ways, that's what's up the terminate. So, you know, and, and claiming that they have folkloric dances or certain national dishes. That is uh, what, what uh, self-determination would mean uh, uh, in, in, in that case. Um, so I think, um, uh, however, uh, uh, a liberal understanding thinks this was a gain. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not a liberal, uh, and I have a critique of these liberal understandings, uh, which I think actually advance uh, this colonial settler uh, logic, uh, epistemology, and most importantly, colonial settler power um, uh, over indigenous populations. Um, but you know, so my understanding is simply to show that this has structured the world as we know it in the last 200 years, that it is not uh, the American Revolution or the French Revolution that have restructured our worlds, but rather a settler colonialism uh, that, uh, that has come to reformulate itself as independent 
and as self-determining and as liberated uh, as it was inaugurated uh, by the U.S. in 1776 and continues to uh, uh, inspire these uh, white supremacist notions of rights and understanding with much resistance uh, in the last uh, 250 years uh, or more. Uh, uh, and, you know, the struggle, of course, continues to accept this. But uh, what I'm cautioning against in trying to give this glimpse of our history in the last uh, quarter of a millennium uh, is to caution against these ruses. Uh, that they are uh, uh, epistemologically suspect, uh, certainly politically suspect. Um, and they simply, uh, seem, it seems to me, um, reenact or reintroduce the same uh, order as a different one. Right? Uh, there's yeah. a sentence that I think Adorno and Horkheimer use about uh, the Enlightenment. Uh, let, let me use this about uh, notions of independence and self-determination, where it takes us from point A, where we are today, with the speed of a rocket to point B, where everything is just the same. No. So, um, so I think in that sense, uh, we are at point B, where everything is just the same. Well, we thank you very much. I think we uh, this this series of talks, and then there will be policy papers and in, in a, in a chapter wants to uh, help all of us to reimagine a better future, critique the existing injustices with a genealogical analysis. And, and your genealogical analysis, of course, gives a lot of anxiety to liberals because it shows their complicity in many of the injustices we see today. Uh, but it's also inspired many people to then shatter the false uh, illusionary narratives and, and think differently about what we can do today for, to create a better future. We thank you very much. Uh, I thank you for hosting me. Many, many thanks for making the arrangements, for inviting me and for hosting me. And I look forward to uh, uh, more cooperation in the future. Yes, I think we should then maybe ask the president of the university to do something on uh, the anniversary of Lausanne Treaty in this way, this talk, or, or a book. Your book could actually be very relevant to think about the Lausanne and its implications. A great idea. Great idea. Well, uh, we thank the audience and uh, for all of you who, who sent your their questions, and we hope to see you in our next conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.